Um, it's lovely to be here. It's really nice to see everybody. I um, would like to open and uh, begin by acknowledging that we're on the traditional ground of the Wurundjeri people and that uh, that mob that has been um, custodian of this part of this old continent for at least 40,000 years never ceded their sovereignty over this place and that we pay our respects to the elders past and present and to the young ones coming through. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Nick and the guys from Elec uh, Electron Workshop um, and a couple in particular, EFA and ThoughtWorks, for bringing us all together today and making this happen and bring, bring a really interesting lineup of people together. Um, I don't come from a technical background at all. Uh, I am one of those people who doesn't quite have the same password for everything. And if you do, you still shouldn't have put your hand up. Um, and I'm one of those people who, you know, if a device breaks, if my computer stops working, I just call for help. I get on the phone to Dave Paris, I want to, you know, like a, an actual smart person, and um, call for help. Um, but I am fascinated by the technology and by the tools. And uh, in the mid 1990s, I guess just by way of background, I, um, me and a couple of mates started up a web development business when people still called it the World Wide Web as three words with the WWW in front of them. Um, and I can remember seeing my first. Um, hypertext page, my first web page, on a, I think on a computer monitor in a showroom or something, and it had a photograph stuck to it and someone had put a background tile on it. I was like, holy crap, this changes everything. The, this is self-publishing and this person may well have been on the other side of the world and yet they stuck a photograph to it. And uh, I was hooked at that point. And I think I still am. Um, the power of the medium of being able to um, that freedom to write, the freedom to read, the freedom to communicate, freedom to organize using this medium, I still think is something new. It's something that never really existed before. And I don't want to kind of valorize it, and I'm no techno utopian, believe me, but I do think that we're seeing the emergence of a global civil society that didn't really exist before because the medium didn't make it possible. And we're seeing things that couldn't exist in any other medium, so stateless, publishers like WikiLeaks, um, talking to some of the coin jar guys last night about stateless currencies and things that are effectively post-national that couldn't really exist without the existence of this medium and its essential unregulatedness. But we should never, never forget that the medium is a creation of the military industrial complex and I think maybe it wants it back. Um, the, you know, the first computers were invented in part to calculate ballistics tables for anti-aircraft weapons and the first computer networks were put together to allow defense and research labs to communicate to each other, including, I presume this is apocryphal, but maybe it's not, um, that the very network architecture that gives the medium its power was designed to survive a nuclear attack, that traffic would simply route around a black spot in the network. Um, but it is, uh, this strange tension, and particularly when we come to questions of privacy, of the fact that it does, the network does have its military underpinnings. And it's being weaponized and militarized before our eyes. Um, but since you, since you mentioned science fiction writers, I'm not going to read in too many William Gibson quotes. I think I'm going to confine myself to just one. But this is one lovely one. Um, he writes, I, I'd always maintained that much of the anarchy and craziness of the early internet had a lot to do with the fact that governments just hadn't realized it was there. That there's been this remarkable anarchic proliferation and development of an online culture largely unregulated and emergent from the, um, from the inception of the medium. And now governments are very, very well aware that it's there. And it's seen by politicians of a certain generation to be something threatening and something requiring much more control. And that's where uh, we start to run into some interesting questions about privacy. Um, a lot of the militarization of the medium is being done under the, the, um, the rubric of national security, this concept of national security, which is also used as a cloak for multiple other agendas. Um, and so um, anybody who's been following these ideas for a while will recognize that old cypherpunk concept, I guess from the 1990s or earlier, of this sort of spectrum where individuals um, have a right to privacy and concentrations of power have an obligation to transparency. 
and that's how you kind of balance up this, um, those, those two competing ideas. And I guess I would put it to you that Australia in 2014 is in the process of getting that equation absolutely ass backwards, that uh, we're being um, subjected as ordinary citizens to a transparency assault where privacy will be obliterated for our own good, at the same time as the national security state effectively withdraws itself behind one-way glass to make itself even more inscrutable than it already is. And two concepts, I guess, that I'll put to you in terms of really practical, pragmatic examples of that balance that the cypherpunks have been warning us about for decades, the idea of privacy for individuals and transparency for the powerful, um, that there are two uh, things in play, I guess, in Australia right now that are quite stark illustrations of the two ends of the spectrum. One obviously being the idea of data retention and how that maps onto the existing regime of warrantless surveillance. And this is something that I'm a bit preoccupied with at the moment, as I suspect many of us are, and so I'm going to dwell there a little bit. And the other one um, is the idea that we just criminalise national security reporting in this country, that it is now unlawful for a journalist or for anybody working actually in any capacity, paid or unpaid, to disclose the existence of certain categories of ASIO investigation, no matter how badly wrong they go. So if, for example, the, uh, the ASIS bugging of the East Timorese cabinet rooms in order, as far as anybody's able to tell, to advantage a particular commercial player in gas negotiations with the Timorese government, uh, that is being justified on, under the grounds of national security. I think it sounds to me like predatory corporate behaviour, but who am I to know? Nonetheless, um, ASIO are now um, seeking warrants to bust the legal counsel for the people who were involved at the time, who've actually had an attack of conscience since then, haven't been able to blow the whistle through the appropriate channels because the appropriate channels aren't working, and have gone to the press. And I would argue that that story is powerfully in the public interest. If that had been cloaked under one of these new SIOs, Special Intelligence Operations, it would be illegal not only to publish it, but to Facebook share somebody publishing it overseas. So we're all caught up in this. So that's, I guess, one really stark example of just how badly wrong we're getting the balance. That bill passed, that's in law. There's nothing that we can do about that for the time being. Um, but isn't it interesting, and I, I, said, I don't think it's just me, even though I know I'm not, not um, strictly a representative audience, but there has been this extraordinary wave of regret um, expressed in the mainstream media. So the internet was already pretty angry about it, certain quarters of Twitter, very cross. Uh, but now you have um, people like Greg Sheridan, who writes for the Australian newspaper. It's rare, this is only the second time in my life I've quoted this gentleman, but I'm going to anyway. Here's what, here's what Mr Sheridan wrote after the bill had passed, mind you, but here's what he wrote. Section 35P of the National Security Legislation, uh, Legislation Amendment Bill, that's the Eurasia Bill, he writes is a terrible piece of legislation that fundamentally alters the balance of power between the media and the government. In doing this, it seriously weakens our democracy and will ultimately weaken in quite practical ways our security. The Abbott government was wrong to propose it and the shortened opposition wrong to support it. Brandis, uh, George Brandis and Mark Dreyfus as the Attorney General and the Shadow Attorney General should hang their heads in shame. That's Greg Sheridan writing practically in the Abbott government's newsletter, The Australian, having us, <laughs> uh, it's actually not that funny, is it? Um, <laughs> but, a, you know, like quite a strongly worded and perceptive piece. And this guy is, you know, he is not uh, any fan of people like Ed Snowden or Julian Assange. He's, he is of a completely different kind of national security reporting normally, but he's had a serious go at them. Um, Janet Albrechtson, uh, another column in the Australian newspaper today, uh, as well as, you know, all of the usual suspects and probably a lot of people that you'll hear from during the course of the day have gone, how the hell did we let this happen and how can we get it off the books? The Labor Party, curled up very, very small in a, in a small target fetal position, voted for the damn thing and are now having an attack of conscience, which really doesn't help us. So. Looking back with regret is useful only in so much as we can uh, organise how to repeal those sections of the Act that are so offensive, but please let's not have the data retention laws go the same way. It would really suck to be standing here uh, at a forum like this in a couple of months' time 
reading editorials about how it was a real shame that we let that happen. Um, I would love to imagine that we can use some of that anguish uh, that is being expressed in the media and in right across civil society and including quite senior political levels to say, well, enough's enough. Let's not have a repeat of that. Good morning. Now, we're going to hear a lot, um, and Abbott made, uh, Prime Minister Tony Abbott made quite a chilling speech about this in Parliament a couple of weeks ago, about the balance between freedom and security. And Australians, which do you want? Apparently, you can't have both, um, which reminds me of a very old Ben Franklin quote. But this axis between freedom and security that we're going to need to move the needle a little bit to protect you is a familiar trope that's been around for a long time. That is obviously not not unique to the Australian political circumstance. Um, but there are particular points of balance. I think it's an oversimplification and actually quite a dangerous idea that we're asked to trade one for the other. But there are points of balance um, that, are, that you can kind of spot the point or the high tide line where society said, in that spectrum between freedoms and security, we're going to draw a line here. Sometimes there are lines. Here's a really interesting one. If um, a police agency, an anti-corruption agency, or a security agency wants to tap your phone, hands up if you have a phone. OK, so this applies to you. This is relevant to you. If one of these agencies wants to listen into your phone call, and let's set aside for a moment the fact that Ed Snowden believes and has presented quite compelling evidence that a lot of this stuff is just being vacuumed up. But let's just imagine that due process and the rule of law was operating in this country. Let's just hold that thought for a second. Um, if one of these agencies, like a police agency, Victorian police, for example, wants to listen in on your phone call, the procedural bar to listen in on your phone call and grievously violate your privacy, let's face it, like the state some guy you never met in some agency you might never have heard of listening to your phone call, that's a violation of privacy. That should only happen for a really good reason. So the procedural hurdles for them to do that are actually quite high. They have to put together an affidavit or more, and that can be quite a complex and arduous process. It has to go to a judge. Uh, in Victoria and in Queensland, there's a public interest monitor um, intervening in that process saying, why do you need that? Does that really need to be for 90 days? Why couldn't that be for 30 days? Do you actually need that? So you've got these various checks and balances in the system. They have to be targeted and discriminate, and you have to be chasing um, some kind of criminal activity that could lead to a seven-year jail sentence. Bar is actually pretty high. And so as a result, across the whole range of agencies that are authorised to, to do that, to listen to your phone call or to read your email, i.e. the content, um, it's about 4,500 of those warrants applied for. And in a country of 23 million people, it doesn't seem unreasonable to me. I mean, that might upset anarchists. I think it's, you know, it sounds reasonable to me. And when you look in the annual report, the Telecommunications Interception and Access Act annual report, for who is doing that wiretapping and the reasons for which they're doing it, none of it looks super alarming. Although we might want to come back a little bit later and ask, what about when they're tapping civil society actors like the Occupy movement at climate change demonstrators? We've crossed some queasy lines in that regard in Australia already. But it's about 4,500. So that gives you the sort of rough order of magnitude. But what about the warrantless authorizations? And um, anybody who's ever met me before, I do tend to repeat myself, I'm sorry, but I'm going to read this number to you now. Um, the warrantless ones for this so-called metadata, the non-content, the envelope, as uh, Senator Brandis would have it, 340,000 in the last year for which we've got reliable material. That doesn't include the intelligence agencies because they don't have to report for some reason. So 4,500 requests under warrant for invasions of privacy, 340,000 two-page forms that are filled out, stamped and handed directly to the phone company. No judicial intervention whatsoever. No serious crime needs to be investigated. Local governments are doing it. Centrelink's doing it. The Australian Building and Construction Commission was doing it to try and string up trade unionists while they existed. Uh, it's right across the board. It's huge. Um, hundreds and hundreds of agencies. There's no theoretical number, actually. Nobody's been able to tell me how many agencies are authorised to tap this material without a warrant. So that needle that Prime Minister Abbott said was going to need to move away from freedom and into the direction of security has actually been blown off the map. Like, technology has completely circumvented that due process and that point of balance that our democracy came to around for serious invasions of privacy, you should go get a warrant. So. That brings us, I guess, to the counter-argument where 
uh, metadata simply being the envelope obviously isn't that invasive, isn't so much of a problem, which is why we don't need to get a warrant. So how much can you tell from metadata? Not necessarily from one single envelope, but what if you collect 100,000 envelopes and make a map of them? Um, like Malte Spitz did, he's a German green guy. Um, if you haven't come across him, Google his name. There's a remarkable article on Decide um, in Germany where he subpoenaed six months worth of his metadata from his phone company, threw it down on a Google map, and you can watch this guy swarming around in the landscape like a microchipped pet. Um, everywhere he goes, where he sleeps, when he catches a train, everybody he sends text messages to, how long his phone calls are for, it's this guy's entire life is recorded in metadata. It's not the envelope. It's content, and people who want to access large amounts of that um, on ordinary citizens for whatever purpose, important or trivial, should go and get a warrant. It's costly. Um, the idea, this is, I guess, this is the system that prevails at the moment, and I'd argue before we get to the data retention question, this is the law in Australia at the moment, 340,000 of these requests, everybody from ASIO, to the Victorian Taxi Directorate getting a hold of that material. The system is already substantially broken. That point of balance uh, has long ago been lost and we need law reform because technology is simply marched ahead of privacy protection. But what if you took that broken system and said, just imagine for a moment that I'm the Attorney General of the Commonwealth of, of Australia, I haven't yet actually used the internet but understand that it is a thing that's out there and uh, a quite contrary to believing that the system is broken, believe that the system is fine, and not only is it fine, uh, we should force the telecommunications providers to warehouse everything. One of the Australian privacy principles, I forget which one, I think it's number three, um, says you should not collect data that you don't need. Don't collect material for which you have no purpose. Don't arbitrarily warehouse material for which there is no uh, valid reason for collecting it. It's a privacy principle, I think it's a very good one. So then the Attorney General comes along, and this is something that has been submerged and operating subliminally through the Attorney General's department since at least 2008. And finally, the AG's department has found themselves a weak and compliant Attorney General who will just do whatever they say. And so the proposal is for the telcos, and you'll hear from Leanne and some of the others a little bit later in the day, trap and store everything just in case these random people might end up being a national security threat or maybe the, the RSPCA might want to track them down. Or maybe, um, maybe they're a dull bludger. Maybe Centrelink's going to want their stuff at some point in the future. And that's the two-year mandatory data retention proposal. Not the content, not recording the telephone call. We'll leave that to the NSA for serious spook stuff. But record everything else. IP addresses, your location, you know, from everywhere you take your mobile phone. If it's within range of two or three mobile phone cell towers, you can triangulate exactly where that phone is. That's how Google Maps works. Um, record all of that just in case and then submit it to this process of warrantless intrusion by hundreds and hundreds of agencies. So we have quite a serious problem in front of us. It's going to be very expensive. So the industry before, because the government still hasn't settled on exactly what it wants. Seven years this has been in play, and there is still no formal definition of metadata in the industry, in the secret discussion paper that a handful of folk have seen but have not yet been made public. Um, there is still no formal definition of exactly what these clowns want. So it's actually quite difficult to establish what it's gonna cost. And the irony is, the service providers and the telcos who are most protective of your privacy are the ones who will have to install the most equipment and raise the costs. So there are some, not, not naming names, that might have to come a little bit later. We might do a brand, little bit of brand shaming down the track. But the telcos and the service providers who are already collecting a lot of this stuff, even though they don't really need to, their upgrade path is obviously going to be a lot cheaper. But the industry-wide cost estimates run to about $600 million and up. And somebody, I don't know who, mentioned it last night that this has been dubbed the surveillance tax. Whoever came up with that, please raise your hand. I'm going to buy you a beer. Great big new surveillance tax, everyone. That's what we're playing with. Um, insecure, like creating these gargantuan new data factories. This material is going to be a honeypot, forcing the companies to trap and store the stuff that they don't actually want to store. Um, what level of security will be applied to that? Are we going to treat it as though it's simply a harmless stack of envelopes? Are we going to treat it with the same um, security that we would treat financial data? 
Um, and how, how will we know what's going to happen when that material walks out the door? The potential for abuse is staggering. I made the mistake of opening up the Herald Sun this morning, and there's a story about bent Victorian police trying to falsify evidence and stitch somebody up after ramming their car. Did anybody see that story? Like, they're just people, right? And those checks and balances are extraordinarily important. We should not trust authority. We should not automatically trust the police. We should not trust government. God knows, having spent a little bit of time on Capitol Hill, don't trust these people with anything. Um, in Germany, and I'll, I'll come to the European experience in a second, where they did actually have data retention through the European Data Retention Directive of, I think, 2006. They had a mandatory data retention scheme uh, for, for a period of a couple of years before it was blown away in court, and it made no difference. It made no material difference to the clearance rates of crime. It actually didn't help. You had the same number of needles, and you were having to sift through a vastly larger haystack. So even that fundamental reason of it'll make you safer turned out to be BS in Germany. Um, and the case simply hasn't been made. Did I mention that this is going to be very costly, that it is in fact a surveillance tax? Can you all repeat after me on Facebook and Twitter? Um, these are one-way laws. Um, once they're in place, it's really hard to wind them back, but the European experience is quite instructive because there is one place where they did have a data retention directive. They had the system in place, and a bunch of renegade lawyers, apparently from Ireland, someone was telling me last night, um, took them to the European Court of Justice and blew it away. And the judgment of that court is really instructive. Let's, let's uh, see what they said. The directive interferes in a particularly serious manner with the fundamental rights to respect for private life and protection of personal data. Furthermore, the fact that data are retained and subsequently used without the subscriber or user being informed is likely to generate in the persons concerned the feeling that their private lives are the subject of constant surveillance. What a remarkable judgment. And so they've blown it away. The UK went ahead and did their own thing and shotgunned something through Parliament in a particularly shameful fashion. But the rest of Europe has actually dismantled data retention. And it hasn't made them less safe. There hasn't been a spike in crime. Um, all I can presume has happened is people's internet bills got slightly cheaper. So can we please preempt this shit and not have it happen here so that we then have to go through the courts? I think we would find it very difficult to knock it out in the High Court. There's no Bill of Rights here. Um, there's no even really implied right to privacy in the Australian Constitution. So can we preempt it and prevent it from happening? Prevent an act of wanton stupidity while we work out the deeper and more complex questions of privacy in the digital age. Let's at least prevent an act of stupidity that will be very, very hard to unpick, that will make the situation work. To do that, unfortunately, Parliament is a numbers game. We're going to need 38 votes. Some of you might have heard this pitch before. We're going to need 38 votes. There are 10 Greens, that's 10. I think my colleagues are pretty locked away. I think we're good. I think we probably have three crossbenchers. So you'd have heard Senator Madigan, Lionhelm and Xenophon speaking out really strongly uh, on the night that the ASIO laws passed. We didn't have enough votes on the night, but they um, were on the right side of the ledger, which leaves 25, which happens by a process of magical coincidence to be exactly the number of ALP senators who were tucked away under their little tables on the night that the ASIO bill went through, hoping no one would notice. 25 votes. So can you help me find those 25 votes? 25 Labor senators. I don't know how many of them come from Victoria. A certain number. Smart people, good people. Can you please bang on their doors and just become an irritant for the next fortnight, just in case Senator Brandis decides to table this bill? If we can peel the Labor Party and the rest of the crossbenchers away and break that, um, that boring and rather pointless bipartisanship that seems to prevail over anything with the word national security in it, then we can actually prevent this thing from passing into law in the first place. So please raise a ruckus. If you have contacts inside the Labor Party or within the crossbench or even within the Libs, because there's some very, very smart people in there who are horrified at the direction that the uh, Prime Minister's taken their party. And as somebody, um, who was Will said at the outset, use the medium to protect itself. We have uh, in our hands the most powerful uh, communications medium in human history. We can use that medium to protect itself, which is what this crazy meme idea was. I don't actually believe that there is a certain critical mass of cat gifts that would have this law um, not be tabled. Like I actually, I, it would be nice if it were true, because we're good at cat gifts, but uh, I don't think that that is the case. However, if we can make the internet basically uninhabitable 
for pro data retention MPs in the next little while. Every time any of these people decides to tweet about something, send them a really funny picture of a puppy saying something really clever about data retention. So we've started this little hashtag stop data retention meme competition. Does anybody, does anybody know about that? Are we being even faintly successful? Hands up if you knew that this is already a thing. A few, a few, but not, not, not so many. So for the rest of you, welcome to this crazy competition, which is to simply blanket the internet in the next two weeks with stop data retention memes. Not, not just Facebook squares, but make little videos, do crazy vines, even go, go on LinkedIn if you want, I don't, I don't mind. Um, and spread the word, spread the word. There are 12 million Facebook users in Australia. So all of your friends collectively, if you were to send something really hilarious out in the next 10 minutes, it could reach roughly 10,000 people. Just this room could reach 10,000 people in five minutes. And those 10,000 people can reach the next 12 million. It's seriously, it's two or three degrees of separation. So using the medium to protect itself means no one's in charge, it's going to be anarchic, it's going to be tremendous fun, but push the stop data retention idea out there so it's visible absolutely everywhere, so that they cannot uh, be under any illusion that people aren't observing what's going on. And come up with something that nobody else has thought of, that would be great. And the, the cleverest one, and the one that propagates the furthest, not the one that I find the funniest, but the one that hits the maximum number of eyeballs, we will be flying to Canberra for dinner in the parliamentary dining room serious, which is strange, um, but likely to be quite fun. Um, so it's really a kind of swarm politics against the machine, and effectively we're looking for those 38 votes by any means necessary um, to delay and delay and delay. This is the third iteration of data retention laws. The first two were squashed, once in 2010 and once last year, and we have to squash this one as well. And it'll come back and we're probably going to have to keep fighting this and other acts of relentless stupidity over and over again. But at least this time, let's see if we can knock it off the table. Um, and find our strength. We found it during the net filter campaign. Again, it was a rather anarchic, swarm-like, uncoordinated, brutally effective campaign. That's the reason that we don't have a mandatory internet filter in Australia in 2014. And there's people in this room who are responsible for that. It doesn't have to be super well coordinated and strategic. It's just got to be as noisy and relentless as hell. Um, while we're working out these deeper questions of how to protect privacy and what it even is in an age of saturation electronic media, can we at least prevent one bad thing from happening? Thanks very much for your time this morning.